we're going to do another activation. This one is the Merkaba. Um, so the Merkaba has been known throughout all kinds of religions. Um, some people would even say the sun disk with wings um, could be the Merkaba. So in like uh, religious texts, I mean, it's been known as, some people see it as the chariot of the gods in the Christian religion. Um, uh, Merkaba has been, it was also translated in a Zulu tribe. There's information on the back that tells a lot of this stuff that it was translated from the Zulu tribe as a, uh, as a vehicle. So it's always been known as a vehicle. And um, as soon as you guys have all the cards here, I'll have you just take a look at the picture on here. So this, um, this picture is a picture of the star tetrahedron. So a lot of people will see this in, oh yeah, I'll take one of those. So as you see, it's the six-pointed star. But this is it on a two-dimensional plane, right? How you just draw it out. It is actually an eight-pointed star in, in, a, in a whole 3D ju, ju, um, yeah, in, in a 3D version, this is an eight-pointed star. It is written here as a six-pointed star just because, um, you know, that's how you see it. But it is made up of two tetrahedrons. Tetrahedrons are simply those triangles. It's a three-sided triangle, well, four with the bottom, but there's three sides to it. And those tetrahedrons, um, when the Merkaba field, it's actually found in a microwave range frequency around the body. Now, the Merkaba is something that is active as we are born. This is part of creating that toroidal field. This creates that tube torus as well. So this is creating an electromagnetic field when it's functioning. Um, it, so Drunvalo Melchizedek was teaching because Thoth gave him the information on how to do this really long two-year process of mudras and breath work and visualization and you would visualize this um, these tetra, this tetrahedron there's one tetrahedron that's around the human body that is fingertip to fingertip the tip is one hand above your head and one hand below your feet is what the size of this geometry is that's around the human body Beth has a star tetrahedron right there which is that's the eight-pointed star so that is, um, so that's known as, as it is spinning and active, it's known as a Merkaba field. And so this field is active when we're born, but usually will shut down right after we're born. For all of us, our ages, our adults, um, yeah, it shuts down right after you're born. A lot of people who kept it active, you can tell are just, they're a little bit super special. You know, they have abilities, all this stuff. You know, so a lot of people that you run into that just seem a little bit different, they kept their Merkaba field active. Now, uh, it started, gosh, when did I say it started here? Um, it started um, back in probably around 2010 that a lot of these kids that were being born um, kept their Merkaba field. And, uh, you know, and it stayed fully functional. And that's what made these kids, this is my belief, is what made these kids so super special, is that they kept their Merkaba field functioning. And um, so when it was about 2010 that I got into the Merkaba, um, reading Drunvalo stuff, and then I was really interested in it because Thoth was teaching my sister. So basically my sister did it the old way that Thoth taught in that old energy was, Doing your, your, doing your mudras, doing your breath work, doing this process every day for two years to keep it spinning all the time. You could do this mudra and breath work and then it would spin your Merkaba fields and they'd be going, but you'd have to do it every day or else it would stop. And after about a two year period, it would remain permanent. So I started doing it that way and I was teaching it that way, you know, because it was so fascinating and you know, you could see shifts in people. Um, people would start to see colors and, you know, it's all kinds of really phenomenal things would happen to people once they activated their Merkaba field. It was huge. It was a huge shift. And so I was so fascinated by it. But then one day I was like, okay, so I had to do 20 questions with Thoth. And I would, you know, and I was, I was like, there's got to be an easier way. And so he's like, yep, you go into the heart space and you, you, you go into the heart space and you pop this Merkaba field out your heart and you know you always had to call in Thoth or Metatron to help activate this thing and it was a still another huge process so 
I went around teaching it that way for several years, um, just teaching people how to activate their Merkaba in the old fashion and bringing in Thoth and Metatron. It was about in 2015 that the earth was ripe, the energies were ripe for us to start doing it without having to call in outside help. Now we just have our soul do it. Our soul is the one that activates it. Um, and then since that time too, we've run into so many people since about that time that would just look at this picture and their Merkaba field would just instantly go. And um, so it's, it's been a beautiful journey with the Merkaba and how it shifted. And it used to be that the earth had a star tetrahedron, star tetrahedron as well, that that was at the core of the earth. And there people have mapped that out where there's the points on the planet where those eight points touch. 2018, she shifted. The Earth shifted. She no longer has a star tetrahedron as her base geometry. It is now a 12-pointed star. And that is only temporary because she, and I don't know where she's at now. We haven't looked in a couple years. But I have a feeling that she, you know, you know, that she still has those, but that she is so multidimensional that we're now finally seeing all these other geometries. So in the beginning, I was so fascinated with this. I used to use dowsing rods and I would find the field of a person and find the different stars. So we would find that, that, um, that one field produces a field, that star tetrahedron spinning, the Merkaba produces a field about 12 feet out. And we'd find that with dowsing, but then we'd find that there's other multiple geometries that are around people. And the people that work with Metatron, like I think I know of one person in here at least that works with Metatron, you know, um, because it comes in the sacred geometries. That's how Metatron speaks is in sacred geometries. But when, um, so we would see these people like that work with Metatron that have like a 64 pointed star around them as well as their eight pointed. And I started mapping these out and my daughter had like some strange geometry of 27 and some person told me, no, that's an impossible geometry. I was like, I'll tell her that, you know, because she's carrying it. And um, so it's got to be the point where there were so many different geometries. And at first I was excited and I was gonna write a book. And then Thoth just kind of laughed and said, no, you're not even scratching the surface because the Merkaba is, we don't know what all the Merkaba is. We, um, you know, in a lot of religious texts, it talks about a vehicle. It is a vehicle to move yourself both physically and consciousness. Um, so the Merkaba activation now is super simple, easy, and we'll just do it real fast. Um, and we'll just pop this Merkaba field out the heart, and it's an electromagnetic field. And if you're sitting really close to somebody, you, they might feel you pop yours out, but you know, it's okay. It's, it, it, they all blend together. It'll be fine. But just be aware that you might feel that because it's, it's kind of a cool sensation when you start popping your Merkaba field. So basically, we're just gonna go into the heart space again, and we're gonna ask the soul to come in to assist, and we're just gonna take a deep breath in and just go and it's just gonna pop right out around the body, and it's gonna be spinning and fully functional, and it is an electromagnetic field. You don't need any other tools because this is the only tool that you can own as a human. Your human meat suit, this is connected to that Merkaba. This is the one tool that you can own. And so this tool is not only an electromagnetic field that you can put intentions into. So we'll go through and put intentions into this field. And some of those intentions, you know, you can be protected from electromagnetic frequencies that it, that it um, that it transmutes all other electromagnetics that come into your field. You know, there's going to be a lot of tensions that we can put into this field, and it'll carry and amplify them for us. So, here we go. We all have that idea of what that Merkaba looks like around our body. We're going to go into the heart space. <sighs> Again, taking that breath from Earth, taking that breath from creation. And as you are in that heart space, and we, our soul knows our intentions of activating that Merkaba field, and we're just gonna visualize that popping out from our heart and going around our body. So we take a deep breath in. Okay, so now then, putting our intentions into this field. Some of the intentions that I like to put are that I am always guided, guarded, and protected. That I have clear understanding and communication with my soul. 
and you can put in all of your intentions from your heart into that field for you, for manifestation, for the release, the clearing work, for the abundance, whatever it is. Because you can do no harm. It is really up to the soul what comes through, but you put in your intention with that. So at this Merkaba field, some ways to use this are just having it in your awareness. If you are in a space that is, feels funny to you, imagine being in the heart and expanding that field out to cover that whole space. And it just clears it. Imagine yourself growing as big as your town. And that big field will just harmonize. It is a field to harmonize with. Now imagine that golden fire. Be sure to bring that golden fire, that golden light out into your field as well. Have the intention that your Merkaba field holds that golden fire so that anybody that comes into your field receives that activation. Now imagine going back to the moment you were born, going back to the moment you were conceived when you first became those eight cells and holding that field throughout that entire time, all the way through from when you were born, all through childhood, all the way up till now. You are the angel that you may have seen holding that space with that Merkaba. We can use this field to transcend time. All right, coming back again. Whenever you're ready, open your eyes. Allow yourself to finish whatever you need. Yes, sir. Question. Oh. So the question was about um, when Dreamflow's work, it was always a 17 breath process to do this Merkaba activation. And then Dreamflow started teaching what he called the 18th breath. And I really don't know enough about that 18th breath. We've never been given that information. So the 18th breath, Drunvalo talked about doing, and you would spin at such a high speed that you would disappear from this physical plane. And there is something with this Merkaba because it is a vehicle. And there is, it, it's so unknown. Because when I've tried to ask Thoth about this stuff before, you know, he just, it, it's, it's not for me to know. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, there's so much I feel that we can do with those Merkaba fields. Um, and again, where it transcends time and it transcends space and it is a torus and it is connected into that heart, that toroidal field of the heart too. And so you can do this activation again and it's a fun thing to do the activation if you ever feel like you're out of balance or anything. You can just take those three breaths, go into the heart, and just pop that Merkaba out again, and it just instantly aligns everything and brings it back into coherence. So that is a fantastic tool just to pop that Merkaba field out again. Um, 
you know, and it's just another tool to use. And, and hopefully we'll send you guys home with a lot of these tools to use. Um, let's see. I think we'll probably have to start speeding up our activations here in a moment, just so that we make sure we get through everything. What's that? Yeah. Well, and I hope you guys are a little flexible on time because I don't know if we're going to make it till 6.30 tonight. We'll just see where everybody's at because um, I want to make sure that you guys get your full amount that you're here for. But in reality, we could probably do all this in the matter of two hours if I just top, stopped talking about other stuff. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we could actually run through this really fast. But I would like to um, repeat some of the things that we're doing just so that you guys can have this to leave with, you know, some solid foundations with this. And that's why I'm happy we're doing the video here too, so that way you guys can look back on this as well. Um, you know, because I'm not giving you guys very much time to do your journey work, and, um, you know, I kind of figured that that's something that you guys can do in the comfort of your own space, is to go back through and do these different journeys and take your time with it and, and let it take you wherever it needs to. Um, so, let's see. Um, we're, I think maybe we'll do the um, working with the pendulums next and we'll anchor in those etheric templates because we talked about those etheric templates um, as being that space and that we would basically do like what our tools are as they're connected to a certain specific thing. Um, is there anybody who did not bring a pendulum? I brought one back to my suitcase. Does that help? It does. It does. So. You know, and the beautiful thing about this is that if you, if you know your pendulum, we can connect to it quantumly and we yeah. can do this. Yeah. And perfect, yeah. And so you can, just, you can just imagine that you have that pendulum and, and anchor that in. Um, yeah, I meant to stop and buy some pendulums yesterday just in case, but I never made it. <laughs> Yes. Yes, and, and you know, and thank you for bringing that up too about the body dowsing, because that's one thing that I wanted to talk about too for anybody. So, is anybody not versed much in kinesiology, muscle testing, dowsing, finding answers in that way? Um, because there's, I always used to use a pendulum all the time, and then I started to do body dowsing because I'd take a pendulum into the store to look for the products that I'd buy for me or my daughter. You know, I was always that weird guy in the, not, not caring what everybody thinks in there with a pendulum or dowsing rods. And um, so then it got to be where I could just body douse. And, and of course it's moved farther, but for body dowsing, uh, you can do this with not only just a product that you're picking up, but a situation, uh, something that you are thinking about for a choice. Um, that your body knows. And so when you go into the heart space and you just hold what it is that you're thinking about, your choice, um, is this good for me? And you can either, you'll feel it as either a good feeling or else maybe you'll lean forward into it for a yes. And if it's, if it's not for you, you might feel that bad feeling there in the sternum or else you're pushed back as a no. So doing that, that balance, you know, that dowsing by holding it there and either going forward or backward is a really fantastic way. And of course, anytime we do this, go into the heart space first um, when you do any kind of dowsing. Um, but then the pendulum, the pendulum was always a great thing for me, especially in the beginning, working with the tools and finding the direction of flow of the piezoelectrics in, in the copper wires and things like that. I would always use a pendulum to find that in uh, the directions of vortexes, you know, all kinds of things you can find with a pendulum, um, not just a yes or a no answer. Um, so, and, and I was, when I, I was actually, um, I spoke out at the National Society of Dowsing a few times, um, and the first time I was out there, um, on the East Coast talking to dowsers, I did not realize that dowsing was more than yes or no or finding water because that's what I was taught growing up was how to find water with the dowsing rods, the witching rods, you know? And so that's what I, that's all I thought dowsing was for. And I was like, well, okay, 
Sounds like a fun thing going out here. And then I found out, you know, those were my people, you know, they're all crazy and wild and into the energy, you know. And, um, and so dowsing is used for so much. You know, pendulums I had found out that, you know, people kept coming over to my table and using their pendulum on the stuff. And I thought they were asking questions to check it. No, they were charging their pendulums so that their pendulum could emit that same energetics. So then once you find something that you like and you're sitting there with your pendulum and you're just having the intention of infusing the energy of what that is into the pendulum, then you can use the pendulum to then transmit that energy. So that's what a lot of people I found out were doing was that they were just using that pendulum as a way to transmit that energy that they found. So these are all just tools, you know, because then we can start to do it with our own consciousness. But it's fun to have these tools because it is a bridge work. It is the training wheels for us to get there to do the work without the physical tools. So this is, this is a really neat process too of connecting your dowsing rods to these etheric templates. Um, so these etheric templates that we found um, that my sister helped me find that, that I then had been creating for all these lifetimes, I started to find very few other people on the planet that were creating etheric templates or that had etheric templates that went to their tools. Very few. And, you know, in reality, that is truly the most powerful thing is not physical tools, but tools that are, exist in every plane as do we. That is why the tensor rings work so flipping well is because they are found in existence on all the planes that we are, all the frequencies. They're in the mental and emotional fields. They're on the physical, obviously. They're on the soul level. So they transcend throughout all of that. Um, so with the, um, we found that there was this one pendulum I was gifted. Um, it's called the Etheric Weaver. And it seemed really cool. It was powerful and potent. But we found that it was connected to an etheric template that when you don't know you have etheric templates, they can get hijacked, basically. That there's other consciousnesses that can come in and utilize those to connect to everybody because that is why ours are so guided and guarded. That's why ours is so protected because that way somebody else can't come in and put their influence into our tools that these tools are always in the highest and best as determined by your soul. That is the base everything of the tools that we create. So they never violate the free will of anybody. Um, even the tools that create an 1800 mile sphere of influence, it is only affecting those in a positive way as determined by their soul. Um, so this etheric weaver I got found it was just really strange. It, it, it was just like kind of sucking energy. And so we, we went in, found the etheric templates, and we cleared them and helped to establish the guardian so that that way only that physical person was able to put the energetics in and anchor those into those etheric weavers so that they weren't just being, you know, connected by just anybody who wanted to play in your energy field. And so... And again, that, you know, a lot of the things that I'm talking about that, you know, like the etheric templates being hijacked and all the entity clearing that I did and all that fun stuff, that was in an old world that is gone now. So a lot of this stuff is kind of not even really needed to be talked about, but it kind of sets the foundation for everything because we are in a new world right now where we don't have to worry about the entity attachments, the, you know, all of the etheric implants, all this stuff. It's no longer the world. We were stepping out of that world. And so um, I just kind of wanted to, to make sure that everybody is on that page that, you know, we don't have to go out and fight demons and things like that anymore because, you know, the only demons that we have to fight are, you know, ours, really. Um, there's a few out there, but, you know, for the most part, it's, it's a pretty clean and clear world right now that we're just kind of mopping up. Um, so with, uh, with connecting these to, so, okay, let me go back to the story again. Sorry, I get so sidetracked, you guys. I just have so many things I just like to babble all day about. But um, the, um, that space where these etheric weavers were connected to, it looks, like a, it looks like a crystal city. And we just called it Shambhala, for lack of better terms. That's just the word that came to our mind was Shambhala. It's a crystal city somewhere in this higher dimensional plane. 
and there, at the time, there were all these um, kind of questionable beings walking around there, you know. And so we came in and we just kind of cleared everybody out, um, made sure that everybody was there in the highest and best, and that you know they were connected themselves. And then we, then there was a lot of the, those who are within our etheric template space that came over, and they're just kind of hanging out in that space too. So everybody's just making sure that that place is clean and clear. And so that's where we started, that's where we connected that etheric weaver into. And so that's just where um, we started to teach people how to put their pendulums and connect that to this space. So we'll take a guided journey and we'll go to this crystal city of Shambhala. And then we'll have our pendant and we'll just simply connect it. It'll just be connected. And then when you use your pendulum, so up there in this space at Shambhala, where there are some of our people up there that are housing some of our etheric templates, basically you'll just be able to use that pendulum to run energy with. Um, and it's going to contain like the chalice energy and the golden fire and all of that. It'll just be like using one of our tools. So here we go. We'll go on a journey. So as you go into the heart, you ask for all of those who walk with you to be with you, and all of those who walk with those who walk with you to be with you. You are so surrounded and just guided and guarded. Now we're going to go to this crystal city. Just imagine yourself just being there as we go to this space. And just trust whatever experience you have. If it's any experience, just trust it. And you have your pendulum in your hand. And you just ask that it be connected there to bring through all those energies that are in the highest and best for you. Your soul is always the one that's in charge. He will never steer you wrong. And again, just keeping it simple, as simple as you can allow. Just knowing that it is connected right into that pendulum. Now we bring our awareness back to this here now space. With your pendulum now, I guess we should have done it before and after, but you know, maybe just run it over your palm just to see if you see how it feels to you. You know, and that can be complicated in the head. I know a lot of people will say that, you know, you spin it in a clockwise fashion and it's sending energy versus a counterclockwise where it's pulling energy. And that can just be that intention that creates that energy flow. But that is a good way to, to do it, that if you're spinning it in a clockwise, imagining it sending out energy, sending out that vortex, and then just seeing if you can feel that in the palm. And so, Using the pendulum, um, I used to use it just whenever I would go anywhere, I would use it just to spin it in clear space. I mean, that's, that's how I used the pendulum most, was just clearing space where I went. Um, you know, and, and people that are really into using the pendulums use it for all kinds of things. They will find out, you know, if a chakra is spinning correctly, and then they'll go over the chakras. And, and align the chakras and make them spin the way they're supposed to. Um, you know, a fun experiment is with plants, is find two identical plants and do a test over time and use your pendulum on one plant and not the other and see how it changes over that season. That has really been a really fun exercise for people to see how it does affect the biological is using plants. They're, they're, it's a great test to do. Also with water. Water is another huge one in that, um, you know, and with the tensor rings, that's what we do too, is that we do a, 
a test, a taste test with two different glasses of water. Either you're anchoring a column of light or you're using your pendulum or you're sending love like they did in Emoto's, Dr. Emoto's work. But you, you do something with one glass of water and not the other and then you do a taste test and you can taste and feel the difference in a lot of the work that you do between those two glasses of water. And again, that just allows our mind to wrap around the things that we're doing are real and they are affecting this reality. Because once we can wrap our mind around, hey, I am affecting this physical reality, it just opens things up for us to actually start doing that, to do the healing work, to do the clearing work, to be the creators that we are here to be. And we just have to allow, get our mind to allow that to happen. And so doing that test with plants and water is really a fantastic way. And again, when you're dowsing, just be sure to go into the heart space when we're doing our dowsing work. Um, okay. So, and again, if anybody has any questions or anything along the way, please do. Yes, sir. Oh, certainly. So there, yeah, there's different ways. Like uh, one of them is is like doing the test like this, where if um, and it's this, it's a kinesiology too, where a lot of people will do that strength test, and that's the same with breaking the fingers, and that's the same with like rubbing a stick plate on a radionics machine, or yes, or just rubbing your fingers or your fingernails. Some people will do it this way, in that when you speak a truth or say something that is true in alignment with truth, that you become stronger. So that's what this little break test is on muscle testing, is that you hold these firmly so that you don't let go of your one fingers. These fingers here, you just hold loosely, but you will speak a truth like, my name is Brian, and it's strong. My name is Sue, and it just slips. Because when, you, when, when that something is not in alignment with truth, you're weaker. That's, that's the... That's the whole concept of the kinesiology. And then so when you're doing that, um, so imagining like this too, when it sticks, so you rub your fingers and some people rub their fingernail. If you say something that's true and it sticks and you can't move it, that is, that's, your, that's your truth, that's your yes answer. And when it slips by, that's your, that's your no. And so uh, that one always kind of eluded me, but I know a lot of people who use that one with just their fingers. And, and once, you, once you get confident into it, then you start trusting it. And then the more you trust it, the more it is accurate. And again, being in the heart space, not asking the questions that'll take you out of the heart, like, you know, should I marry that person? You know, whatever. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you, you do the things that are in your heart. Now, a good way to know what you are doing and, and to prove to yourself is to take a deck of cards and do the red or black. Red or black. You ask the question. And then after a while, you know, you'll get to the point to where your, quest, your, your answers are more consistent. What's that? I don't quite follow the red or black deck of cards. Oh, certainly. So, yep, so you'll take a, uh, a deck of cards and you'll be like, okay, the next one is black. And then you'll either be like, okay, it's strong. I'm not moving anywhere. That must be black or else it slips. And you're like, oh, okay, that must, be, must not be black then. It must be red. And so then you flip your card over and see if you were correct on the, the answer that you got, if it's a yes or no. So basically you're just asking a yes or no. Is this a black card? Yes. Check it and see. And then is this a black card? No, check it and see. And so that's, that's really a good way to gain the confidence. But, but don't let yourself get frustrated with it if you're not getting it. Um, you know, and then maybe try a pendulum or something else if you're not able to get it in some certain, you know, doing muscle testing in any other way. Just find that thing that is yours and always be in the heart. Yes, sir. So, yeah, then that's the next step is that once you get really good at your red and blacks, then you can start working with your numbers, you know, and then you can gain the confidence in your own knowing because I tell you, there, the, the clairs, the, the, the clairsentience, the clair, um, clairvoyance, you know, the clairvoyance is being able to see, 
you know, the clairs are just those different abilities that we have. And so a lot of people can see things, a lot of people feel things, you know. And so that's you guys too, as you are doing this work, if you can't see something that we're doing, don't worry if you don't see it because innately we all know it. And that's really where we are moving into is this field of knowing. And we're gonna take a journey work next into the field of all knowing. And into this field of all knowing is a place that we go to that is beyond the mind that we go there with questions and that we can come back and receive the answers in synchronicities. Is there anything morally wrong with that? What's that? Is there anything morally wrong with Oh, mor morally wrong. Um, playing poker? You know, <laughs> oh. oh, oh, for, for, you mean trying to trick the casinos? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that, that'll be between you and your soul. <laughs> Be because, you know, and, and that's it, is because any of the work that we do, it, it's, it's, your, it's your soul. It's your soul working, so it's the, it's the spirit, the soul, and then it is working through the innate consciousness of the body. So when we are dowsing or muscle testing, the body knows, and so does the soul, because the body and the soul are very much, you know, they're in cahoots with each other. And so, you know, it's the mind that's always kind of, you know. And so... Um, yeah, so the, the moral thing, I don't know about that. I, I know I can never go Dow's for, um, we live up by Fairburn, South Dakota, where the famous Fairburn agates. I can Dow's for things all day, but as soon as I go to look for an agate, it'll never let me find an agate for some reason. So some things would just, if we're just not allowed, I guess. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Can you speak more on the, what you think about that? Oh, the... Oh, certainly. Okay, so the question about, um, about the entities that were no longer here. So, yes, yeah, so, you know, for all those years, I was doing the entity clearing, and that was, I felt my soul's calling. That was my job. That's, man, that's what I thrived on and everything. But then um, our fr friend Jeanette Crowley, actually, she's the one who started talking last August, and she said, yeah, I found out that by September 21st that all this outside influence is supposed to be gone. And I was like, you know, sometimes you're not quite in alignment with truth, Jeanette. I don't know. I, I, just, I, I just don't believe that because this is, this is the work I do. That's why I'm here, you know. And lo and behold, September came around Equinox and what used to be a daily activity was done. Very, very few times in the past almost year have we been clearing these entities, especially the ones that are just free roaming around. It used to be that I'd walk down the street and see, you, so if you look into a person's left eye, you can see their soul. If you look into the person's right eye, you usually see the ego. So when I would look into a person's left eye and I couldn't see their soul, I could see somebody else standing in front. And that's when I always knew that they had an entity attachment because there was somebody besides their soul that was standing there. And so for me, I thought for sure every person on this planet had an entity attachment because that's every person I met. Basically, I was clearing entities all day long. And, you know, and then they told me, no, it's just, you know, those are the ones that are supposed to come into your awareness and, and you know, that's what you do. And so I found out not everybody on the planet had an entity attachment. But then, so as last equinox came about, last fall equinox, um, yeah, lo and behold, we weren't doing this as a daily activity. We would run into it once in a while. Some of these entities, like even just a couple of days ago, we cleared some huge big thing that was affecting a lot of people. And it, um, it had been there for lifetimes with that person. So that's what we're finding a lot is some of these things that are either the human is holding on to it so tightly that it won't let it go, so it can't go. Um, and some of it, it's just, uh, so soul contracts was the thing that we used to work on, is because we've seen that, you know, nothing happens to us that our soul does not agree on. And so, you know, the things that we saw as soul contracts are the people that are your family, your kids, um, the people that would come into your life that were very, um, you know, transformative, 
you know, things like that, not just everyday people that you might see out on the street that you have no interaction with, but these are people that come into your life, those were soul contracts. And those contracts are the things that we made before we came here. And the things that we've always done has been about soul growth and learning. And that's why it's been so damn tough all these lifetimes. I mean, I tell you what, we've, we've lived through some pretty, pretty wild things in our lifetimes, you know. And it's always been in the name of soul growth and learning. And so now we're stepping into a whole different world. And so that was part of our journey was clearing these soul contracts that no longer served us, especially those in this lifetime, that, hey, we don't need to do that anymore. That's what I love about theta healing. I know a few guys talked about theta, is because theta healing, that is one of the things that you do, is you go to the creator and you release and clear contracts. You say, okay, I want to download the rest of that information that I'm supposed to learn. I'm so close to learning my lesson. Let's just complete this right now and let's just get this download of information so that my lesson's learned and I'm done. That's what we put into the rings too. Is, and that's what we put into our first ascension chambers was the clearing of the soul contracts, the completion of them and the releasing of them. And it's amazing because when people cleared the soul contracts, a lot of times, you know, people would get divorced. You know, uh, just different things. I mean, things would shift in your life between people once your soul contract was cleared and done. Um, you know, er and everything changed. Um, and that just, so clearing the soul contracts is those eons and <coughs> eons of stuff because some of these things, contracts we've been carrying since way back. And so releasing those just allows us to have more freedom, more freedom to be in alignment with our soul and not having to be doing all this other stuff. Um, so, so yeah, in September where, the, where all that outside influence has been gone, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the earth grids and some of that work that we used to do. Um, and we'll do that here because we got about 40 minutes left here before we take a break. So I'll give you guys some long storyline here and maybe we can do another activation before we take off for lunch. But um, so the earth grids was something that I was called to work with was these different grid systems. I was, I'm a self-taught dowser and you know I would find those different geomagnetic lines and I read about to like the Hartman grids and, and all these different grid lines because people think of ley lines as like being just a general term for these earth magnetic lines but ley lines are very specific lines um, that are on the planet that are basically if, if you haven't seen some of these maps that show like um, these different ley lines that go across the planet, you know, under like Washington DC is a huge intersecting of these geomagnetic lines. One of my favorite places on the planet is uh, the medicine wheel in Montana, or Wyoming, in Wyoming, uh, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, because that is an ancient place where there is so many intersecting of these geomagnetic lines right there. Um, and it is a very powerful spot. It goes back to the Atlantean times, all of this. Um, so with these geomagnetic lines, when geomagnetic lines intersect, they create a vortex, a vortex of geomagnetic energy. And these vortexes is where you can find portals. And so every sacred space, every naturally occurring sacred space on the planet, like in the Black Hills of South Dakota, we have the 13 Lakota sacred sites. They are sacred sites because they are the intersecting of geomagnetic lines that create a vortex and there's a portal there. And um, so these are naturally occurring ones, but then some of them can be diverted. People learn how to divert geomagnetic lines. You diverted geomagnetic lines with an obelisk is one way, uh, putting an obelisk. So my first experience, so I was on a college campus in Aberdeen, South Dakota. I was using my dowsing rods and I was dowsing all these geomagnetic lines because it was just a passion I was doing. You know, I was like, you know, it was really fun. And I found that these two geomagnetic lines came on the college campus to this big 100-foot tall obelisk building. And they came there and one went out. And I traced it to the state capital of Pierre. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. And then I had my sister look at it. And she's like, wow, no. It's not only is it bringing those together and diverting it, but it's also shooting it up into some other grid. And we're like, wow, okay, that's all just weird. And, you know, and I really wasn't too aware of a lot of things yet. I didn't have my sight or anything like that. 
but I felt like there was something watching me the whole time. And I left, and I was on the way home, and I felt what felt like claws in my chest. And it was hard to breathe, and I had to pull over, and I called my sister, and I was like, what the hell's going on? And there was a guardian of that obelisk that freaking attacked me. And so we cleared it. And I was like, okay, there's something going on here. And so that's when I was like, okay, there's got to be something to this all if this is all being guarded that well. And so where it went to that state capitol, we found that there was all these grids that were all these, where all the state capitals are. There's these grid systems. And so when you see those big copper top buildings, that is sending that grid system information into a different higher grid. And so that's, yeah, so that was really interesting. Okay, so, yeah, um, so, okay, I'll have to go on with that story. I need a drink before I go on with that story. <laughs> Not that kind of drink, but almost. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so, actually, we didn't go to the state capitals first. We, I found that, okay, there's all these things like copper top steeples of all these old churches that just kind of give me the creeps when I look at them. And I was like, okay, what is that? So we went to some of these churches in the Midwest, you know, that are great, big, tall, huge churches in these tiny little communities. And um, we found a dragon. And, you know, you always see the old pictures of Michael and he's got the dragon down there with his spear in his hand, his foot's on the neck of the dragon and he was trapping dragons. Nah, Michael doesn't do that. Michael's cool with dragons. Um, the church, actually, it wasn't Christianity. It was all religions. Any church built before 1946 was connected to this grid. And they harness dragons. There is an abnormal number of dragons on this planet because they were all brought in to create grids. Dragons create grids. My first experience with the dragon was in Montana where I was having my dowsing rods and I was finding these geomagnetic lines looking for the sacred space that somebody had in this valley and to put up a, um, an anipi, um, a sweat lodge. And uh, so I was using my dowsing rods and I found where there was this giant granite boulder, this giant granite rock. And that's where one of these lines started. It didn't come from anywhere, but right there, it was a dragon. And then you look at some of the old Chinese texts where they talk about the dragon and the tiger lines. So the dragons are the ones who create these lines. The, the earth, the, more of the earth-based dragons, because there's a lot of kinds of dragons. They would create these lines. And so I was like, okay. So when we found this dragon in this first church, it was basically pinned. It was like it was chained and pinned underneath of this church. And it was creating that grid line that went up. And so we found, too, that no matter who it was, priest, pastor, rabbi had an entity attachment. And this dragon was connected to this larger grid. So we come in and we would pop that pin and we didn't want some pissed off dragon just running around. So we'd always, you know, open a space for the dragon to go wherever it was in the highest and best good because we really didn't know enough about the dragons at that time. But we knew that they were working against their free will. We knew that for sure. And so we freed all these dragons. So that's what I did for well, about a year and a half was I drove around to all these tiny little towns in the Midwest, went and cleared, cleared entities. I just drive up, park on the street, clear the entity, pop the pin, free the dragon. Um, and that's what we did, you know, for a while. And uh, then I was like, oh man, there's gotta be a better way, you know? <laughs> and so my sister said, hijack the grid. So that's what we did. Me and, me and my path partner at the time, and I think Brenda helped, no, not, actually Brenda wasn't a part of that one. And then all the dragons that we freed, and of course Archangel Michael and Raphael and all those guys, um, we called in everybody, and we went through that entire grid system of the church grid on the planet, and we popped all the pins and freed all the dragons and cleared all the priests, pastors, rabbis, and it was phenomenal, but they wouldn't let us touch the Vatican. They called it something different. I think they called it the ancient something. But anyway, they wouldn't let us touch the Vatican. And we're like, well, why not? You know, that, we want that place. And they're like, well, because 
Some people still need it. That stuff was still needed for people to make the switch, to wake up. Because if this world was just pretty butterflies and bunny rabbits and flowers, we would have no reason to change anything. So there still needed to be that disparity that would be waking people up. So we were not allowed to touch the Vatican at that time. Um, I think, si yeah, I think since then it's been cleared. A after after these last few huge, there's been a lot of um, huge shifts on the planet, and I think all of that has been pretty much shifted out of there because a lot of that was so. Okay, let me tell you about this grid system of the, that church grid system, which is beyond all religions. Higher dimensional beings. Just because you're not in the same frequency. So if you're in a different dimensional frequency, you just can't see you with the physical eyes. So these higher dimensional beings, and that doesn't mean if you're in a higher dimension, you're good. Um, well, good. But they were basically harvesting energy from people. That's what it was, is energy harvesting. People were batteries. And you would feed on their fear. Fear is a big one to feed on. Fear is, fear, is a huge, fear is a huge motor of creation. And that's where we've been creating, is we've been creating from here, fear, necessity, survival. That's how we've created our world. Um, so anyway, that, you know, so that was what that was. And then, going back to the state capitals. The first state capital we went to was Cheyenne, Wyoming. And instead of the dragon being pinned there, that whole building was a dragon. It was a whole different dragon. It was huge, and it was just wrapped around the building. And, those, and the state capitals have so many different geomagnetic lines. All those different obelisks that are, all over, that are all over, these obelisks were the ones that were diverting geomagnetic lines. They were creating a grid system. And then those state capitals all were being fed. And so when we went to that first state capital in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we were like, okay, yeah, we got this. We did all the churches. We're going to do this one too. We jump in there and we fell into fear. When we fell into fear, we got nailed hard. We all got sick. Our families got sick. We quit doing energy work for almost a year. Um, you know, and we were like, okay, we're done. This, this isn't for us. And um, then as we started to gain our power and our light and understand that you are untouchable when you stand in your power, then we went back again, and then we started to clear them. And so we cleared all of those, all of those. And then the wild thing is, is that even the cemeteries have the grids, and the cemeteries were feeding that state capital grid. Because in cemeteries, there's usually either a, a, a rod stuck in the ground. Um, so there's always some kind of a transmitter that feeds these grids that are kind of, you know, you can imagine them being up off the planet. Um, so there's always something that feeds those grids, whether it's a copper top steeple or a dome top roof or a stake or an obelisk. So they were all feeding those grids. And so that's, you know, in the cemeteries, there's so many ghost waywards and they were part of that battery system too that was just feeding all this stuff. And so we cleared all those, except for Washington, D.C. It would not let us touch Washington. <laughs> and again, it was for the same reason, that there still had to be the center, you know, I still can't express that reason very well, but it had to do with something about it had to be there for people to wake up for whatever that reason is, that disparity, whatever that is, that had to be there. Yeah, Washington is cleared. Yep, so if you look at that map of Washington, you know, in there's, there's so many different layers to that. I mean, you look at a map of Washington, you see where there's all those streets and the grids and even one-way streets and towns. One-way streets and towns were also because they kept the energy flowing in a direction. And then you'll look in towns where all these churches are aligned and, you know, there, there's just a lot of stuff with these grids. Um, but, but those are cleared. And then the military grid base, all the military bases on the planet that are made by the United States are all on top of these intersecting geomagnetic lines. They're all on a grid system. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, no, I do not remember that from Mary Hardy's. Um, but so he was talking about the obelisks and how they Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and no, and so 
so there has, I don't know if you guys have seen it, I only get my news from Facebook memes, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, that's the only place, I, you know, so anyway, there's those things with those obelisks that were just appearing in the middle of nowhere in the deserts and things, and I don't know what those were. To me, they, they don't feel, they feel neutral, they don't feel good, they don't feel bad, because, so the thing is, is that, um, okay, let me, let me, I'll just keep going on a story here. Um, Oh no, no, I'll, I'll try to get to answer that question about um, that I don't, I think that they are, I feel that they are neutral, that they're not good nor bad um, because of the fact that Gaia, Gaia, the earth, consciousness of the earth, does not allow that stuff to happen now. Um, so for these grids, um, it was in 2018, okay, I'll take a step back. We started a thing, um, called the Global Love and Gratitude Grid. Okay, well, we'll start here at the beginning. This is called the Golden Fire and Light Wand. At one time, we were trying to find dowsing rods. We were making dowsing rods for a person, and these dowsing rods, we wanted to be something that we could do a lot of the work automatically because when I first started teaching dowsing, you know, I would teach about the way Slim Sperling did it in that he would find geomagnetic lines that come into a building. And Slim would take these sacred measurements out of copper and he would call them staples. And he would stick them into the ground. So we would use our dowsing rods and we would find where these lines come into a building at. And we would put a staple in the ground right on the edge of the wall or outside the building and it would cause that geomagnetic line to bounce up and over or down and under the building so it wouldn't go through the building. The reason that we did that was because geomagnetic lines can carry energy and information. So if you live downwind from a nuclear power plant or a really crappy part of the neighborhood where there's a lot of dense consciousness and energy, and that line comes through there, it is carrying that energy and information on that geomagnetic line. Maybe you step there and you just kind of feel, uh, you know, and then you notice when you're not right there, you feel better. So that was one of the reasons that we would just basically bounce these lines up and over our space. So I was teaching at a library and I forgot my staples. And so we found all these geomagnetic lines. And I was like, oh crap, we don't have staples. So I was like, okay, we're just gonna do this without the staples. So we all had the intention of creating that bubble where they just went up and over and down and under, and it did, and it stayed. And so we were able to use consciousness to do that. And so that was an epiphany. So somebody was asking me to create these dowsing rods for them. Um, and uh, so I was like, okay, we're gonna make them out of sacred measures, and we're, we want to create an etheric template that is brings it in so that when you use your rods, you're automatically clearing any of these geomagnetic lines that they're either clean and cleared that come through or else they are moved around. And the same with geopathic, which is like underground waterways, things like that, that we wanted to move these underground waterways, all this kind of stuff. So as Brenda and I were working on creating these etheric templates, and by the way, whenever we try to create these etheric templates, they never come out how I intend. Only once or twice have I had them come out the way the human intends. They always are different because my perception and my soul's perception are not the same usually. You know, I really, I'm trying to get there. So, um, so anyway, we were trying to create these dowsing rods and this ancient etheric tool came in, this golden, golden rod of light about this big is white and gold and, and it wasn't active and so Brenda activated it and then it started to get all fuzzy because it was emitting sounds and other colors and it was just this wild thing. And we're like, wow, okay. So that's what we'll put into these dowsing rods. And this golden fire rod, or this golden light rod, I think we just call it, we found that it is older than this galaxy, maybe older than the universe, and it will clear timelines and realities for the person. It'll move and clear geopathic and geomagnetic lines and um, all kinds of other fun stuff. So we're like, okay, that's, that's what we put into our golden fire and light rods. And so, um, so that, was, that was finding that ancient etheric tool. Now then taking another step back in time, I used to be a water operator for all these little municipalities in the Black Hills. I worked for like 
four or five different towns where I was the certified water operator. And I was just getting into the energetic stuff. And so I had heard about columns of light. And so I was like, yeah, I'm going to put columns of light into the water. And it was really awesome because the first time that I intended to create a column of light, and how you create a column of light is you just go into the heart space. And basically, if you have um, a water tower, let's say, and you want to put a column of light in there, you just pretend that, that this is you and you're doing the trinity breath where you're grounding and connecting and it becomes a column of light just like we are. And that was really awesome because the first time I did that, I could see where it shifted the water in the water. Well, actually we did it in a well and it shifted the water in the water tank and I could see it as bright light going through the entire municipal water system into a person's glass, into a person, back out into the earth again. And I was like, holy crap, we can affect that. So um, when you do a column of light like that way, the old way, that column of light will only stay there for eight days because you have to put your attention back onto it. And again, uh, being in all those five municipalities and they each have like six wells, and I was getting tired of going there every week and putting my attention onto there. And I was like, Brenda, there's got to be a better way. And yes, there was. So the columns of light now will last indefinitely. They, they'll last more than eight days because we are using the golden fire and light wand. So we are using that ancient etheric tool when we create our columns of light. So the columns of light is one of the biggest things that I go around the world to teach is the columns of light and creating these because um, it's profound. Um, so... Now then, when you create a column of light, it stays there. And at first, we were only using that golden fire and light, or that golden rod, that ancient etheric one that we would bring in. And then we created the golden, golden light wand. And this was really phenomenal for anchoring into water towers and to cell phone towers. And it would actually change a cell phone tower to be, we'd hijack cell phone towers. And instead, it would transmit the frequencies of love and gratitude. So actually, before this came along, okay, I, I'm kind of going out of order. Before the golden fire and light wand came along and we were anchoring the columns of light, I was like, Brenda, there's got to be another way. She said, create a grid. So we went to a source of water in Hot Springs, South Dakota, really special place of water. We anchored a column of light. And again, that column will stay there as long as you have your attention onto it. It'll fizzle away in eight days. So we started to ask beings to come in like Archangel Michael, the consciousness of water, and other beings that we worked with, other ascended masters, and we asked them to hold their attention onto this column of light for us, so it'll stay there. Then we created another column of light, and then we watched the two connect. So basically we created a column of light, then there was a connector to it, a grid, that went to the other one. And so we started to do this, and we started to teach this. This was in December 26th of 2012, that we created the, what we called the Global Love and Gratitude Grid. And we basically put in the intentions of creating that frequencies of love and gratitude. So then we started to do it into cell phone towers. And then when you did it into a cell phone tower and you watch that column of light and you watch it connect to the rest of that grid that is held into place. And then that cell phone tower is emitting the frequencies of love and gratitude and it will be beneficial to everybody unless you go into fear as an individual and be like, oh, that damn tower is frying me. All of a sudden, you, as a powerful creator, did not allow that other beneficial creation to be there for you. It's still there for everybody else. So that's, that's where the thing with fear can cause a different creation than what is really there. Yes? Oh, we will go through all the activations and attunements with the golden fire and light wands. Okay. Yes, most definitely. Because we want to be able to teach everybody how to anchor the columns of light. Um, because then, you know, I know there's a lot of you. Judy talked about it, driving down the highway. Anchor that light in that tower. I know Beth does it too. Yep, yep. And so, you know, at first we were mapping out these things and we were having everybody write in and tell us where they anchor columns of light. And God, there got to be so many of them. We couldn't do that anymore. But I mean, we've, I know a lot of us who have been anchoring those lights, uh, it makes a huge difference and it shifts so much stuff. It really does. Do you have a question? Can you rewind to the brickwork in the official buildings in the copper roofs for a sec? 
Sure. And you may have covered it, but um, I want to be the three-year-old that says, why, why, why? Why did it get like that? Um, They were guided to. So those who were, um, we did the Masonic temples too. The Masonic temples were a whole different critter. The Masonic temples also had a dragon that was basically built. And when we did a Masonic temple, we would have to come in and we would watch as that building was energetically taken apart brick by brick and rebuilt in bricks of light after the dragon was cleared. And then every Masonic lodge also had seven people in a hierarchy that had entity attachments. And so the answer to the question about was this intentional and was this a creation? Yes, very much so. This, were, this is the, the world that we lived in all the way up until just recently. That we have lived in this world of basically it's been a free for all of all of those across this universe um, to come here and play in the duality experience. But again, we signed up for this and nothing happens that is not within our soul's path. You know, um, good analogy, Hitler and the Jews and the Holocaust. Hitler was a phenomenal soul, is a phenomenal soul. He signed up to do that dirty work. Every person who died in the Holocaust signed up for that. Our soul, that is part of our soul contract, is our birth and our death and so much in between. That is what our soul chose before it came here. So when you see a three-month-old baby dying and it's heartbreaking, you just have to remember that that is what that soul signed up for, as were the parents. They all signed up for that experience. And so this playing in a world of duality where there was all of this going on, this was... It was meant to be. It's what we signed up for. It's what we came here to do. That is the soul growth learning crazy process that we have been in. And so, um, you know, it, it's, we, we can't, you know, and so that's it too, is we, 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 we got to try not to judge that because that was all there for a reason. That was all there in the highest and best. Our souls would not steer us wrong on all these experiences. Yes, ma'am. We are transitioning now into an entire new experience as humanity and as the universe. And that is where we are seeing this chalice energy coming in. And this chalice energy is allowing us to, to transcend into something completely different. And that's why we are dropping all of our old soul contracts. All of our old soul families are splitting up. Um, you know, everything is changing fast right now because we've been dragging this through eons we've been dragging this through the mud and so everything that's coming up now that you guys see that's all dark and funny and the news and all this crap you're just like oh my god you just remember it's always been there it's just that everything is coming to light right now and so we're just like oh shit this is all new and oh my god all this is happening you, you just got to take a step back yeah and be like okay <laughs> it's all been there it's just a time of no more, no more lies. You, 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 there's, there's a time where everything is exposed. That's right now. We're not playing in all the fields of deception and all the stuff anymore. And then we can look forward to experiencing what? Well, we can look forward to experiencing one, joy. Joy. We're going to do some uh, journey work this afternoon. So this afternoon is going to be mostly journey work, so we might actually be all asleep this afternoon. This afternoon is where we're going to get into the real depth of clearing contracts, of clearing programs that have been instilled in the human since the beginning, all of that. We're, we're going to be getting into that this afternoon. And so that is what's going to allow us to step out of a lot of this old muck is clearing all of that stuff. Um, and so, again, just a lot of the stories right now, just so that we can wrap our mind, because again, we're working with mind, body, soul, and so we just got to get the mind on board with everything. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned about wanting to work with children, and I was a substitute teacher, and there is a need, and given what you just said about their soul signed up, signed up for whatever they're experiencing at whatever mm -hmm. age. So, 
the best thing for us to do to have compassion for these kids is to be in their presence. Hold space. Yep. Be in their presence. Just be. Yep. So, I mean, so it's going to be a whole spectrum of what it is that you are feel drawn to do and just follow your soul's heart's passions for whatever that is. But we're going to get to the point to where we do nothing. We do nothing. We just, we just be. And then as we be, we affect the entire reality of everything. And that's where you get into joy. Your job is just to do what makes you feel good. Yes. Yes. Soul's heart's passion. Uh-huh. So um, the columns of light thing has been huge. So then once we started to activate the, the sacred heart, the golden fire, then when we create these columns of light, we can create them in cemeteries because then that golden fire is there and it just allows the crossing over of all the ghosts waywards. And so these columns of light are huge. I mean, they're powerful, powerful stuff. Um, I don't know if we'll do it today, but we used to do a thing in class where we would find, um, we'd use dowsing rods, and we'd find, like let's say, how big the energy field of a bottle of water is. And we would find how big that energy field is, which is usually about one to three feet, depending on the water. And then we would put a column of light into the water. And then we would, of course, have to move the water out of the column of light. But then we would find how big the field is. And sometimes it went out 300 feet because it, it just transforms the water that much. And then we can do electrical um, places too. So if you see a wind tower, or if you see one of those uh, huge transformer places that's in the big fences, big fenced in areas out there, where all the electrical transformers are, you drop a column into there, and then that will follow the electrical. So here's another quick story is that we made, I um, uh, don't have one sitting out here. So we made these, we used to make meter rings, these rings that would go over top of your electrical meter because when they first came out with smart meters, people were having the effects of that because of the, the, the Wi-Fi transmissions and everything in there. But electrical meters are not good in the first place because between your fuse panel or your electrical meter, it doesn't matter if it's an analog or digital or whatever, it produces a field of electromagnetics that's about five and a half to six feet out from there and it's very discoherent. So when people sleep or spend a lot of time in those fields, it can affect you. You know, people get sensitivities to electromagnetics. Um, and so what we started to do was, um, so we took a meter ring and we were putting it over that, over the meter. And it was only affecting the transmissions of the meter. Because in there we had the frequencies and properties of all the plants, crystals, minerals, all that fun stuff. And it was transforming electromagnetics that were within here but we needed it to go throughout the whole electrical system. So we worked with the consciousness of electricity. Yeah, electricity has consciousness. So we worked with the consciousness of electricity as soon as we brought that into the rings. Then when we put the ring onto an electrical panel, it would follow that all the way back to your local transformer and connect to everybody. So we've had um, professional dowsers who come out and they'll take just one of our tiny little rings. We have um, a little ring that you can put onto your panel that will stick or else plug into the wall. And um, she found that when you put that onto one of those green transformer boxes that sits out on the, on the lawns or the kind that are up on the poles, you put that ring on there. And before she measured that, it was in the negative thousands for on the dowsing scale of, of, of the energetics of that transformer and in the negative hundreds on your electrical panels. She put the ring on there, it changed that to positive hundreds, and every electrical panel connected to there, it changed it to a positive hundred as well. Positive hundreds. So it changes that entire electrical system. And so when you anchor a column of light into one of these huge transformer areas, that also is bringing through that consciousness of electricity. It's bringing through everything that the tools have into that column of light when we, when we get attuned to this. And then, it affects everybody connected to that. Yes, ma'am. Fiber optics carrying information. Ooh. At least in the Twin Cities, there's fiber optics dropping everywhere. I'm in IT. I deal with that all day long. Uh huh. Same thing? Same idea? <laughs> yeah, never considered that one. Holy smokes. That's huge, Beth. <laughs> 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 Yay! <laughs> so we can drop columns of lights in our fiber optics. 
Yep. Yep. And then it'll just affect, it'll go back and it'll affect everything back to the source of that, especially if that's your intention. Yes. Yeah, you, there, there is things in the web. I mean, we, we've run across, as soon as they released the carnivore, back when the Twin Towers went down and all of a sudden they released this carnivore program, a carnivore was an acronym for this program that they released into the World Wide Web to keep an eye on all the funny keywords and stuff. It was an electric dragon. Holy smokes, this thing was funky. And it, yeah, so we cleared that thing. It really was a carnivore. Um, so this one, I think, was actually, this one actually does, did not have a soul spark. It was a creation of consciousness. Very rarely in this planet, in this universe, do you run into anything that is big and dark and funky that does not have soul spark. Very, very few things that you ever see have no soul spark. But that was one that did not. It did not have soul spark. And so when you are dealing with something, and if you find something that does not, so anytime you run into anything big and dark, you look for their soul spark, you look for their spark of divinity, and you just watch it grow, and you watch it ground and connect just like we would do with ourselves or a water tower. We just watch it expand, it connects to their higher soul self, and then when they are connected to their higher soul, they drop their agendas, they drop their soul contracts, and they go. It shifts them. It's the reminder that we're done with duality. So shift that, maybe shifting that in like individual, like anchor We will actually be going soul to soul this afternoon. So that's another thing that we will be doing with that sacred that sacred space is we'll be going soul to soul with other people and we will allow basically we'll be holding space for everything that we do for ourselves here today. We're going to bring that into the space and allow that to happen with that person. And anytime we do this work, so before you know when we've done work like hands-on healing work or anything, we'd always be like, okay, do I have your permission to do this? We were going person to person, human to human. We're going soul to soul. When we go soul to soul, you do not have to have permission from the human because it is between the soul and the human that we're working with right there. So when we are working soul to soul, we can do no harm. Because all we are doing is we are holding that space and that intention, and it is again between that soul and them. We cannot violate the free will of a soul. Not as a human, and not as a soul. We are all on such individual paths and perceptions and the way we see things and what we see is so individual to us each all um, but to me just feeling it it doesn't it feel bad it feels like it was you know just just a normal occurrence of things happening you know and, and some of the stories that you told when you were doing your introductions I was like oh wow yeah that's that's all your soul stuff that's your soul work I mean you being shown the different things of anchoring geometries on the planet, you are also participating in that. Well, yeah, it's so it's consciously that in this life of who I am, like a farm boy, right? You know, I'm just an ordinary, very ordinary person in a lot of ways. And then I, I had a dream, like, I was a grid worker. Like, I knew I was a grid worker. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I see we're almost out of time. I think maybe um, we'll let you guys go here so that we can do our thing. Um, actually, let me uh, tell just a couple more quick things about the grid work um, before we go. That way when we come back, we can just jump right into doing the light anchoring. Um, so for this grid works, you know, we created that global love and gratitude grid. And then part of that story was is that in 2018, Gaia, she sloughed off all of the non-beneficial grids. There was even the reservation grid, which is really horrific um, in this country. Um, that one, yeah, that one was icky. Um, but there, there, all these old grid systems on the planet, Gaia sloughed off all the ones that were left. And so all those grids disappeared, but she took on the global love and gratitude grid as a organic grid on the planet, 
which was super cool. Um, so, uh, so with that, what we were talking about before, about those obelisks that would appear out of nowhere, I feel that there is no power meant to them because nobody is, is it, if they're a thing of intention, that intention can't override Gaia, you know, and she's just not, she's not playing that anymore. We're, we are stepping into something all new. Um, one more quick thing about the grids um, here in just this last minute. Um, actually, no, I think I'll just stop talking about the grids because I have some other things to cover about the grids when we start talking about the ascension pyramids and the ascension grids that were created here not too long ago um, that are a part of Gaia's natural grid system too. Um, so yeah, when we come back this afternoon um, at 2.30, we're gonna meet back here, is that correct, 2.30? So just be sure that you're here at 2.30. That way we can get in and knock you guys out for a quick nap while you're full. So.